tonight. Let's stand together. Let's begin the service, please. 456 in your songbooks. 456, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. I'm raising both hands. How many blessed tonight? Oh, yes, let's sing together now. Oh, when upon life's mellows do our singing tonight and so often if we're not careful we count our burdens instead of our blessings and it's good to be in the house of God tonight what a blessing to be together and uh, I was pulling out leaving the college this afternoon and I saw brother Sam Finera pulling in and my heart rejoiced to think of God's people meeting together tonight to be in the house of God and I look forward to Wednesday night. What a joy it is to be here. We're glad you're here, and I want to welcome our online listeners as well. Let's commit this service to the Lord and ask God to do a great work in every heart tonight. Father in heaven, we sure are grateful for the privilege to gather with our church family and to, Lord, sing songs to thee, and, Father, to hear the preaching of thy word. And I ask, Lord, that every heart would be open tonight. And I pray that we would leave here rejoicing in your goodness to us. We thank you for the way that you've blessed us so abundantly. I pray for your touch upon every aspect of this service. May it bring glory and honor to thee. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. Amen. Turn your songbooks, please. 433. 433, please. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. If you don't know the song, sing along with us and learn it. We'll start on the first together. Four. 33, you sing it together on the first now. When my way growing drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, the last I long, take my hand, precious
singing. Thank you so much. On a hill.
are good songs on a Wednesday night. I thought about 1 John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, right? That we've been called the sons of God. It was bestowed because of an old rugged cross and a man named Jesus who hung there and bled for us. There's something about that name. You know, the Muslims don't sing. The Muslims don't sing Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. And the Buddhists don't sing Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. But we sing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I thought about the angel said, you're going to call his name Jesus. Then Mary looked down in the face of that child and whispered his name Jesus, and all of heaven and earth rejoices. That name resounded there in that stable, because there's no name like that name. That name makes uh, the devil tremble by that name. We're saved. There's no name like that name. Thank God for the name Jesus. They've tried to, maybe you've heard about the news lately, they've tried to vote him out, they've tried to remove him, but Jesus is still on the throne. They couldn't recall him. He's still on the throne tonight. Thank God for, that's a, good, that's a name worth coming to church on Wednesday for right there. Thank God for those songs. Those girls sing pretty good, don't they? It's hard not to sing good. I could probably sing decent about that. No, hell no. All right, take your bulletin. Take your bulletin with me tonight. If you need one, wave the ushers down. Trip them as they walk by, whatever it takes. But make sure they know that you need a bulletin. Please wave at them, and they'll give you a bulletin as they pass by. We'll go over these announcements for the week. Really, we could call time out and shout over Jesus, though. I enjoyed that. That was worth coming here. You fought traffic, had a long day at work. You might not have eaten, had dinner yet, but that's okay because you've got to hear about Jesus already. Coming up on Friday at 8 a.m., we have a live broadcast, as we always do, but this is a special one because you have the opportunity, and I'm nervous. I'm nervous for Pastor, and I'm nervous for Brother Moyer. It says here that you have the uh, ability to call in live on the air. Is that true, Brother Moyer? Yep. I can't wait to call. I'm excited about it. We should all do that. This Friday at 8 a.m., you can call, and you can tell us about your rash and all your medical problems and those things that you're dealing with. Not really. Don't do that. But call in and be a blessing at 8 a.m. This is going to be an interesting broadcast. On Saturday at 9.15 a.m., we have our faithfulness rally, and of course, every member of the church is encouraged and invited to come and be a part of that as we have a short challenge from the Word of God, and then we pair up and go out soul winning and visit the uh, the uh, those that are uh, follow-up visits and shut-ins in our church. So come at 9.15 a.m. We'll meet in the youth auditorium, and we'll have our faithfulness rally. At 8 p.m. every Saturday night, we have men's prayer, and if you've never been, come and get in on it this Saturday, and it, it's worth your time. It's worth that little 20 minutes, 30 minutes of your Saturday evening to come get encouraged and edified and just uh, energized, if you will, for Sunday services. God meets with us at men's prayer. So all you men, from uh, the most uh, senior men to the youngest man, you come with your father, you come, you college men, and we'll have prayer meeting at 8 p.m. there on Saturday. Of course, Sunday's a busy day, a packed day, Sunday school at 945, and the services you can see following there. Uh, North Valley Publications, if you look at number four, this Sunday, you can be one of the first to purchase a copy of a new book that is being produced by North Valley Publications. I've already read this book. I know Pastor is using this in his church ed class, but it's a book uh, called Jonathan Edwards, The Preacher. I always tell this to the young men in Bible college, you got to read the Bible. And second to that, you got to read biographies of great men. This is a biography of a great man, a man God used to shake New England and bring revival to his area of the world. And you ought to plan to buy this book on Sunday. It'll be available through uh, North Valley Publications. You can get that there at the bookstore. The Sunday school classes are beginning to take up offerings to cover the costs of the mission conference upcoming. And I think that's a great idea. I was having lunch yesterday with several preachers, and they were asking for things like this. And, and I said, well, here's something our church is doing for missions conference. And they thought, we'd never thought of that before. But I tell you what it does. It takes the burden and the weight off of the pastor so he can enjoy the meeting if we take care of these little things even before the meeting happens. All of us pitch in. Many hands make light work. And a Sunday school class, ours will take care of a gift basket. Others are taking care of gift baskets. And we'll begin that on this Sunday. The Brick Campaign is up and running again. And would you pray about that? If you need a Brick Campaign card, the ushers have those even tonight. If you'd like to get one, if you'll just raise your hand, they'll get you one. You don't have to pay tonight. Just take it home and pray about it. But all that you give to the Brick Campaign goes to debt retirement. And we are chiseling away at that much quicker than scheduled. It'll be gone before you know it. And these little bits help. So $500, you can purchase a brick, and it'll go here on the foundation in memory of someone or in honor of someone or a Sunday school class, a Bible verse. You can take care of that. Workers training 
Workers' training begins this Sunday night at 5.05 p.m. in the Golden State Baptist College Chapel. Every church member is invited to come and hear from Brother Flood and others as we go through these several weeks of workers' training. So make sure you have that on your schedule for Sunday afternoon. Youth Hour will be this Sunday as well, 5.05 to 5.30. And Brother Reamers, as always, will do the teachers' meeting at 5.30. And I'll make one last announcement for Brother Martinez. Number 10, his big day is this coming Sunday. It's their sweet six. 16 anniversary, a lot of prayer, a lot of preparation, a lot of perspiration, a lot of paying. That's good alliteration, Brother Bertram, is it not? Has gone into that big day. So if you would please pray, and there's another one, pray for him for his big day, that God would bless, give them souls for their labor, and we're looking forward to getting a great report from that big day. Pastor's going to come at this time and speak to us for a moment. Good, thank you. I'm so glad to be in church. It's been a wonderful week, a wonderful day, and uh, thank you for the bricks. I know they're not going to sound like a lot. We're up to seven, and I just read the inscription, what they're putting on uh, the last week or so, and that's tremendous. We had somebody uh, drop by uh, two more bricks today. That's nine, and the money for that bri those bricks, and, and so it's on its way. I think Brother Luke Flood told me we have 53 left on this to end to this uh the foundation to the end of the building. I like to turn the corner, but you know, I'm not gonna keep working this uh, maybe year after year, but it's just wonderful to see. We are gonna do this. I don't know when Brother Flood will do it, maybe after uh, the last day, October the 10th, but people are gonna be standing around this building. Let's just destroyed at the Trump. Uh, people are gonna stand around here. See these buildings that will be around here during the tribulation. Now, I will promise you, people will be delirious. Some will have anguish. They'll be wondering. And we're going to perhaps take as many as 10 bricks as a church family, and we'll just keep buying them. How to go to heaven. Someone's going to show up here, and they can't get in the building, but it's going to say, they'll read those things, how to go to heaven. And then we're labeling the Romans road to salvation every scripture verse, and then how to pray. I think it's going to be one of the greatest things this church has ever done. You know, years ago, Brother David Azarello was saved and baptized here. He's a pastor, and he, he, uh, he was in charge of this. When we opened up these three roads here, they weren't here. We opened up Compassion Lane. Why is that called Compassion Lane? That's where the buses go. That's their driveway. And Romans Road, on the way in, you can see it, on the way out. We put the signs up day one, and a delivery man was here. And as they were putting those signs up, he said, I wonder, you know what all those signs are about? He walked them down the street, stopped at every plan of salvation scripture, and led that man to Christ. And uh, we're looking forward to that. I also want to say it's been such a marvelous day in school. I love Wednesday, I, elementary chat. Your, your kids are the best. They are such a blessing. My, this year has been a blessing to me because Brother Martinez goes with me to all three chapels and leads music, and if I want to lead something, I do. I've had a strong voice all day, except for about two hours this afternoon, and it's back now. I felt like I was in the service tonight. I was yeah. sitting over there saying amen. amen. I don't want to sit. It's just, you know, yeah. it's got to come out. And, that doesn't work, but uh, good singing. High school chapel is such a blessing. And then college and just the class I teach today. How about Brother Galvan, deep and wide? There's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Are you ready? Get your hands ready. Brother Manley, take your arm away from your wife there. Come on, let's go deep and wide. I know it's the first time you've seen her. Here we go. Try it together. Turn that pen up, please. Deep, deep and wide. Deep and wide. There's a fountain. Man, I will, I will. Which one are we on? 
man. Fish. Here we go. I will make you fishers of man. I will make you fishers of man. another one and brother cooper make an announcement about fishing for souls every day if you will i'll see the track right where are we going to next let's get one more in there you well i got out yeah that's a good one you get go ahead <laughs> All right, so out in the lobby, we have the display for Jesus every day. It was empty. Brother Reamer sent me a picture Monday, and he said, looks like it uh, went over well. The track rack was emptied out, but we're going to have more tracks bundled and prepared for this Sunday. So thank you for starting this off so well, being faithful to it, and we'll continue it on this Sunday, Jesus every day. If you've missed this week, you can start next week. It's never too late to start fishing for men. They're out there. John Rice said, the sea of humanity is full of fish, and they're always biting so we're gonna fish every day we had a whole big stack of people volunteer on Sunday night I was amazed I got the sheet today I'll work in the nursery I'll drive a bus it's just wonderful I understand that ten of you at least if not more went and looked for my weed out there I made a mistake last time I made a mistake was uh, I, I can remember the day so vividly, 1923, I, last time I made a mistake, haven't made a mistake since. I looked at that weed and it was there today. But the weed has blossomed, it's a flower. Strike that from the message. People went out there looking, and said, where's the weed, where's, the, that's a flower. So, two mistakes in 90 years, I guess. Here we go. Uh, do Lord, oh do Lord, how do you remember me? Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house. In my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house. in my wife's car tonight to come to church and she has brother martinez playing and brooke singing this song and it's not in our hymn book do you know brother uh, caleb gallon this this is just what heaven means to me and i know you don't have music and you know you know those words i'll figure it out yeah you know how it starts you you, you have it on your cd but that was years ago who knows uh, remember what it is can't remember the first word right now. I'm going to have a class tomorrow morning. I get to go with Brother Galvan. He has 22 people at pianos in one of his piano labs. And we're going to talk about filling the holes tomorrow. And I heard you filling the holes on this one. And it was good. Come on, Brother Martinez, please. 
There's a country where no twilight shadows deepen. Unending days where night will never be. what heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder? We'll join the throne upon the glassy sea. What heaven means to me. Then at last we'll see the face of Jesus before his image, other loves just flee. We have the memorial service for Brother Mark Giovanelli. What a good man. You know, I sit on the radio this week one day. Uh, he, he served God to the very last day. He was in the ministry serving God. I hope if the Lord uh, tarries and I go home, I hope I'm serving God to the very last day. His service tomorrow, the viewing is from 4 to 6. Service uh, with Brother Bertram, and I'll be there as well from 6 to 7. And then the final viewing seven to eight so if you want to come that'd be great we hope you will it's um 471 east santa clara street in san jose sort of downtown then i want to talk to you about the offering tonight brother cooper mentioned our classes many of our classes are taking 500 worth dollars worth of different things i know the spanish department has signed up for two thousand dollars before we, the, the, the conference and I don't know what we're making the budget right now. It's the 17th, 18th, and 19th of October. I would have guessed it's going to be 25 to 30,000. We have six or seven missionary families, their kids. We have to feed them for uh, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and we'll take care of them. And we have always gift baskets from the publications in their room, and we have fruit baskets and food there. We have to make sure they have lunch every day. We'll feed them here in the dining hall, and then we'll make sure they have dinner after every service. One of our chefs will make lunch for them. On Saturday night, we always take them to a restaurant here, and they have orientation. And then there's travel expense by car 
at $4.50 to $5 a gallon now. And there's airplane, uh, and there's love offerings. And, uh, and it's always really, I, I love pastor's conference so much. I love it, being around those preachers and get, I, I love it. And I love youth conference. It's just wonderful. But this is where God speaks to you and I directly. It's our church. And missions conference is such a blessing. And I know we'll reach it. I know we will. By the 17th, we'll have all the money. And then we'll, uh, some nights probably, perhaps, we generally don't even take offerings. But let's have it taken care of. Ushers, please come. And tonight, we're beginning to work on that. And uh, I hope that we'll do our very best uh, to have a great offering. Brother David Rush, you're out. The last week, I think about seven, eight hundred tracks. I think five hundred this afternoon. Teenagers, you've had a long day, and God bless you. Had a soul saved today. Amen. Come and lead us in prayer for a good missions conference offering, please. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for our church. We thank you for the wonderful service we've had so far. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint the preacher and the preaching to come. Thank you for the offering, Lord, and the ability to give towards Missions Conference. And what an honor to give to Worldwide Missions to know, Lord, that the impact that it's making will reach eternity. And, Lord, we want to be a part of that. We want to invest in it. We don't want to sit on the sidelines. Lord, we want to be involved. Thank you so much for a wonderful church who gives. I pray that you'd meet these needs. Bless the offering now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. joy it is to be in God's house tonight. I'm thankful that no matter what goes on outside of these walls, we have a place like this to come to as a haven. I'm glad that it is a place at times to escape the craziness of this world, and I'm so thankful that we have the North Valley Baptist Church. At times, it's even uh, a place to escape the craziness in our own homes, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm so thankful. We had a wonderful day, as Pastor said, in chapels today, in tremendous elementary and middle school, high school chapel, and just a great day at school. We've had such a great spirit since we've been back and went home and decided that I was going to spend uh, the afternoon in the backyard praying and reading and studying, making sure that I was set and ready to go. And I got a call from my dad about 4 o'clock, and he said, I saw the city truck in front of your house. I, I forgot to tell you. He said, forgot to tell me what, Dad? They're turning off the power at 4 o'clock. I'm like, well, they didn't leave a notice at my door. No one said anything about it. So maybe it's just your house. If, if you know where we live, we're on the same block, just a street apart. And I thought, well, maybe it's just his house. About two minutes later, my daughter Addison came out the door, and she said, Daddy, someone turned the power off. And I thought, great, just what I need to get me in the spirit tonight. Get me ready. And so we went inside and we started getting ready and of course there was no ability to have a, a hot dinner or anything like that. So my wife made some amazing sandwiches and I made the comment, I said, you know what, I really should have invested in a, a generator that I had on my house. She's like, yeah, you should have. And I thought, oh man, I'm a failure. I blew it. I'm a loser. 
As dinner went on, my wife said to my kids, would you like to miss patch class and come hear Daddy preach? And Reagan immediately said, no, I'm good. And Addison said, do you guys sing any Patch the Pirate songs? And I said, no. She said, no thanks. <laughs> and my wife then began to ask me questions about my message tonight. Although she didn't ask me about the message, she said, do you have any funny stories to tell? And I said, you know, babe, I, I don't. She said, do you, do you have any jokes to, to share with the people? I said, I don't. I, all I have is the word of God. That's all I have tonight. I'm sorry. And so I, I apologize. I have failed already today. And uh, have you ever been there before? You feel like I, I just blew it? Remember a few weeks ago before school started, Pastor uh, addressed us and he said, we're getting back to school. Let's make sure, families, that we get back into schedule. You know, the night before school, let's calm the house down. You know, let's light a candle at dinner. Let's play some soft, even-tied music. You know, turn on KMVBC. And then families have family devotions. Get to bed at a, at a decent time. And I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do just like Pastor said. I'm going to set my house in order. It's going to be great. After dinner, the kids were kind of putting things away. And my wife says, all right, guys, grab your Bibles. We're going to have family devotions. And my youngest daughter, Addison, said, what are devotions? <laughs> And we looked at her and she said, oh, is that when we go around the room and say what we're thankful for? And I thought I blew it. I'm a failure. <laughs> so it is great to be at church this evening and escape. If you would turn with me to the book of Mark this evening. Mark in chapter number 6 is where we'll find our text. Mark in chapter number 6, perhaps one of the most familiar, one of the most famous Bible stories of all time. If you have been in church for any period of time, especially if you grew up in Sunday school, you have undoubtedly heard this story dozens and dozens of times. In Mark chapter 6, it is one of the four places that we find the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It is the only miracle that Jesus performed that is found in all four Gospels. It's amazing how well we know a story, and how, or how well we think we know a story. Maybe we've read the passage dozens of times. Maybe we've heard many messages preached about it. And yet, you, as, as I was reading it, God showed me things that I had not seen before. And my hope this evening is that I will be able to be brief and that I will be able to be concise and I will be able to give you something that will be a help. Brother Bertram was encouraging me before time and he said, uh, Brother Fenera, let me, let me share with you two things that I've learned while preaching all these years. He said, always preach about Jesus. Always preach about Jesus. Amen. And then he said, always preach about 20 minutes. And so I'm going to try to do those two things today. I want to take after Brother Bertram. And I've alliterated all my points, Brother Bertram, so I hope I make you proud. Mark chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. Let's begin reading in verse number um, 30 this evening. The Bible says this. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert by ship privately. And the people saw them parting, and many knew him, and ran a foot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And let's bow our heads together in prayer. God, we do love you, and I'm so thankful that we have this place to come. Lord, to be an escape from all that is going on outside. Lord, I pray now that our attention would be focused on your word. God, I pray that you would please use me as I seek to be a blessing and a help to these people. God, I pray that I could be an encouragement to someone tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Very familiar story, one that I believe we all know. 
The disciples had been out preaching and teaching and doing miracles, and they came back to be with Jesus. And as they began to tell Jesus of all the things that had happened, the miracles that had, made, had been done, the places that they had been, Jesus says to them, let's go and go to part into a desert place. Let's take a break. Let's get some rest. Let's go away from the busyness of what's going on, and let's go and take a little getaway. The people then see Jesus and his disciples going down to the Sea of Galilee where they board a ship. As they see him departing, they begin to follow on the coastline. I imagine they may have been saying over there in that boat, you see that boat? That's, there's Jesus. Jesus and his disciples, they're going out. Let's follow them. Let's see where they go. Maybe we can go and maybe we can see Jesus. Maybe he'll do some miracles. Let's see if we can follow him. And as they began to go, the crowd gathered. And as they began to tell people like anything, when you see a crowd gathering, what's going on? What's taking place? And well, Jesus, Jesus is on that, bo that boat over there. We're going to follow him. We're going to see where he's going. And the people began to gather. So at the point that Jesus and the disciples get off the ship, the Bible says there is a multitude gathered. Amen. We know there are 5,000 men plus women and children. Some estimate as many as 10 to 15,000 people have now gathered to hear Jesus. The Bible says that as Jesus got off that ship, that immediately he had compassion on them. Because they were as sheep having no shepherd. The Bible says he began to do miracles. He began to heal their sick. He began to teach them. As the day went on, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we have a problem. All of these people out here have nothing to eat. Jesus, we're in a desert place. The surrounding isn't good. The, the location isn't good. And the day is now far past. We're running out of time. Jesus, send them away. Let, let them go. Send them back home so they can take care of themselves. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, give them something to eat. Feed them. Figure it out. Feed them. And they go and they bring back five loaves and two fishes. Jesus takes it, and he blesses it, he breaks it, he divides it, they distribute it to everyone. In the Bible, we know the story. Every single man, woman, and child eat, are filled, and they take up the remnants, 12 baskets full. Yeah, hey. An amazing story, an amazing miracle recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This evening, I'd like to point out a few different aspects of this story and then apply them. If you would look at Mark chapter 6, verse 35 and 36, I want to notice this evening, I want us to see the outlook of the disciples. The outlook of the disciples. The Bible says in verse 35, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about, and into the village, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. The perspective, the outcome of the disciples was a negative outcome, or outlook. They said, Jesus, don't you know where we're at? We're in a desert place. L look around you. Th this, this isn't a good place to be, to have all of these people. Yeah. It's not a desirable place. It's not a place where we have provision, or we have resources. It is a desert place they said, Jesus, we're in a bad spot. Yeah. Not to mention, we're running out of time. It, it's going to be dark soon. The day is ending. Jesus, we have to send them away. The outlook of the disciples was dark. The outlook of the disciples was negative, that we are in a bad place and we're running out of time. But I'd like us to notice the obligation of the Savior. Look in verse number 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Because they were sheep, not having a shepherd. He then responds in verse number 37. He says, give ye them to eat. See, the obligation of Jesus Christ was, you don't understand. I, I, un, I know we're in a bad place. I, I know that we're running out of time, but you don't understand. Because I, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. I, I can't turn the multitude away. I can't send them off with, with this need. I am here to meet the need of this lost multitude. Yeah. I am the great shepherd. There is a need I have to meet. I can't send them away. He had an obligation. The disciples looked at the physical and said, 
we're in a bad spot. Let's get rid of them. Let's, let's not deal with the need of the people. Let's send them away. But Jesus said, no, we're not going to send them away. Feed them. Feed them. This obligation created an opportunity. Because he said, go and find some food. Look in verse number 38 this evening. He saith unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. If you go back a verse in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. See, the, out the outlook of the disciples was negative. It was dark. The obligation of the Savior is there is a need that I have to meet. I can't send them away. There's something I have to do about meeting their need. This created an opportunity. The disciples then began to dis uh, disperse. And I imagine they went around and began to ask people, do you have any food? Is there anyone who has any provisions? The master is wanting to know, do, do you have any food? Is there any bread? We have an opportunity here. Jesus wants to do something. He wants to meet a need. And we're wondering, is there anyone here who has some food that they can give to Jesus? That opportunity came to a little lad. John chapter 6, verse 9, the Bible says, And there was a lad. I imagine that little boy sat there. And as the disciples came by, they said, Does anyone have any food? Do you have any food over here? Is, is there any food over there? And there sat that little boy. And that little boy, no one knew it, but that little boy knew that I have a bag. And inside my bag is, is a lunch. I, I have five loaves. I have two fishes. My, my mom packed it for me, perhaps. And there it is. And there's an opportunity here. Jesus wants, is asking, does anyone have any food? And I have something in my bag to give. It, it's not much. It's definitely not enough to feed everyone, but it's all I have. And, and Jesus is asking for it, but I see now there is an option. That option is a choice. Am I going to give Jesus my lunch, or am I going to keep it for myself? I, I know it can't feed everyone, so maybe I should just keep it for myself. M maybe I should just nibble on it here and there. Maybe I'll eat it myself, or... Maybe I should give it to, to Christ. I imagine as the disciples came by, he, that lad maybe raised his hand and said, Mr. Disciple, Mr. Mr. Disciple, come here. I, uh, what is it you're asking for? And maybe perhaps Peter came and said, Well, little boy, the master has this multitude, 10 to 15,000 people who are hungry. He wants to meet their need, and he has sent us on a mission to find someone who has something that he can use. And that boy said, well, I don't have much, sir. It's really not a lot. It's just five loaves and it's just two fishes. But I'll tell you what, Peter, go ahead and give it to Jesus and let Jesus do something with it. I see the outlook of the disciples was negative, but there was an obligation of the Savior. He said, I can't send them away. There is a need I have to meet, which created an opportunity for the people. But it came down to an option. That is a choice of that young lad to give what he had to Jesus. Amen. We, of course, know the outcome. Look in verse number 39 this evening. And he, being Jesus, commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes... He looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. All. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments Amen. and of the fishes. See, the outcome of this story is that Jesus did the impossible. Jesus took these five loaves and these two fishes and he blessed them. And he break them. And he sent them throughout the multitude. And every single person ate and was filled. And they took up the fragments and there were 12 baskets left. We know this story. It's an amazing story. But let's bring it home now for a moment. Let's apply it to our lives. I think it's very obvious that we live in a dark day. Yeah, we do. 
As we look around us, we, look, we see what's going on in this world. It is not hard to see that we are living in a crazy day. Yep. When you read the news, when you see what's going on in the world around us, but not just the world around us, when we see what's going on here in America, in our very state of California, yep. it's easy to have a negative outlook. It's easy to say, well, here we are. We are in a desert place. And you know what? Time is running out. That is a true statement. Last week we had that evangelist, uh, amazing preacher, and he preached about the soon coming of Jesus Christ. The reality is he is coming soon. Amen. The day is drawing nigh. We are running out of time. But let's not forget that there is an obligation. The Bible says in the book of 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can I say this evening that there is still an obligation of the Savior. He still wants to save people. He, did, he has not quit. He is still on the throne. He has not given up and said, all right, well, I guess there's nothing that he can do. No, his desire is to still meet the need of the multitude. I'm reminded that not only does the Savior have, have an obligation, that you and I have an obligation as well. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Can I remind his church family that we have an obligation to reach the lost. It, I, I know we're in a bad place. I know we're in a desert place. I know we're running out of time. But that does not change the obligation that God wants to still save old sinners and it's up to us to give the gospel. With that obligation, there comes an opportunity. We have an opportunity this evening. Last Sunday night was such an amazing service for the work of the ministry. We got these nifty little books. You still have yours in your Bible. You know what this is? This is a book of opportunities. Amen. There are opportunities in here. We're looking for hot lunch volunteers, bookstore workers, brass instrumentalists, security parking lot setup. You know what this is? An opportunity. Pastor says, look, church family, we are running out of time. We still have a mission to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is opportunity for you to serve at the North Valley Baptist Church. But I see it comes down to an option in your life and in mine. It comes down to a choice. Will we be used of God? Will we do something for the cause of Christ? I feel that so often in my life I miss opportunities. The Holy Spirit prods and perhaps I don't yield myself. Perhaps I miss the opportunity to do something for the cause of Christ. I remember one Sunday afternoon, we had finished church, and we were going with our family to get a bite to eat at the Sizzler. How many Sizzler fans do we have? Good old Sizzler. Steak and a uh, side salad, good stuff right there. And we had gone to Sizzler. We had got out of the car, and we were waiting for Pastor and Mrs. Treber to join us. And we began to walk in, and a young man approached me, and I could see very quickly that he appeared to be maybe a, a, a vagabond or someone who was traveling from place. He didn't have any belongings with him. His clothes were dirty and uh, scruffy. And he asked me, do you, do you have any money? Do you have any cash? And honestly, I did not. I did not have a single dollar in my pocket. And I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't have any cash. He turned and walked away. And the moment he did, the Holy Spirit smote my heart, saying, go talk to him. Give him the gospel. It, it, tell them the good news. And I have to admit this evening, I didn't heed the Holy Spirit. Instead, I heeded my stomach and we went to Sizzler. We went into Sizzler, we had a good time, we had a good meal, and as we came walking back out, we walked to the car and the family was waiting there and I began to check my pockets. Honey, do you have, do you have the keys? Any of the kids, do you have the keys? Looking through the windows, oh, there they are, doors locked. I locked my keys in the car. I'm like, well, this is great. This is the only set of keys I have, and now I'm stranded here. And so I called AAA. Where's Brother Kissel? Oh, he's not here. I called AAA, and 
they were going to be about 20 minutes before they came out. So Pastor loaded up my wife and the kids and they went home. And I sat there by the car and I waited. They pulled off and about two minutes later, around the corner, came that same young man. And again, the Holy Spirit just smote my heart and said, go give him the gospel. Go talk to him. Go, go, go ask him some questions. And I, I approached that young man and I said, you know, before you were asking me for, for some money, w would you like a meal? And he said, I would. I, I haven't eaten, I think it was four or five days. I said, let's, let's go in. We were at Jack in the Box. I said, let's go into Jack in the Box and I'll, I'll buy you a meal. And I had the opportunity to buy him a meal and we sat down and I asked him questions about what are you doing and you know, where are you trying to get to and told him a little bit about our church and I said, let me ask you the most important question. And there at that drive through Jack in the Box, he bowed his head and trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And while I'm so thankful for that outcome, I often think about that first opportunity where I didn't listen. That opportunity that I passed up. I'm thankful that God gave me a second opportunity. But the reality is this evening is that God is not going to force you or I to do His will. God will never force us into being, being used of God. He, he won't force us into a position where He will use us. That has to come on our own. And it comes to a choice. The Bible says in John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look onto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, we must make a choice. If we are going to serve God, if we're going to do something in the day and the place in which we find ourselves, it may not be perfect. It may not be ideal. It may be a desert place. We may be running out of time, but we still have an opportunity. Amen. What is your choice going to be? I like to say number one, God isn't as concerned as you and I are at what we have to offer Him. You know, sometimes we get so hung up on ourselves and what we think we can offer God. You know, sometimes we may look and say, well, I, I can't preach like a Brother Cooper. I'm not a fiery preacher. I, I, I'm not a, a deep biblical teacher maybe like Brother Bertram. I, I don't have the vision and the faith and the God can spirit of our pastor. I, I can't sing like a Brother Martinez or Sister So-and-so. I, I can't teach a Sunday school like they do. I can't run a bus route like they do. I'm not as dynamic as they are. Can I remind you that God isn't concerned like you and I are as, as to what we have to offer God. He isn't concerned with it. John 15, 5, we're reminded that for without me, ye can do nothing. You know what that tells me? It's not about us. It's not about what you can do. It's not about what I can do. It's not about any talents. It's not about any abilities. It's all about Him. God wants to use you this evening. God wants to use me with or without any talents and or abilities. I want to say number two, that God has already given you what He needs you to have. In this story, the disciples come to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we need to feed the people. We don't have food. Send them away. And Jesus says, feed them. They said, should we go buy 200 penny worth, worth of bread? Meaning, should we go get what we don't have? Should we go into town and, and get the resources we need? And Jesus said, no. What, what do we have? Go and see. See what we already have right now. Don't, don't be concerned with what we don't have. Don't be concerned with, with what you can get or what you might acquire in time. What do you have right now that God can use? And we know that Lat says, all I have is five loaves and two fishes. Jesus didn't say, oh, that's a little tough. That, can you get more? Get some more and come back and see me. No, that's not what he said. He said, good, bring me that. That'll work. I'm reminded of the story of Moses and the burning bush. One of my favorite Bible stories where God appears to Moses and says, Moses, I want to use you. Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses says, God, who am I that I should go before Pharaoh? I, I'm a nobody. God, I, I don't even know what your name is. What if they ask me? What if they say, who sent you? I don't even know what name to call you by. God, God I, 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 I'm a stutterer. I, I, can't be, I can't do anything for you, God. And God answers Moses and said, Moses, what's in your hand? 
What do you have there? And Moses, I imagine, looked at it and said, well, God, it's, it's a rod. It's a piece of wood. It's a stick. I found it on the ground, and now I walk with it. It's a rod. And God said, I can use that. Amen. He, he didn't tell Moses, a rod? I'll tell you what, Moses. Go back and get a sword. When you got a sword in your hand, come see me. I can do something with that. He said, what do you have now? Yeah. A stick? Great. I will use that rod. I, I will empower you. I will use that rod to do amazing things. Why? Because it's not about the rod. It's not about the five loaves and two fishes. It's all about Jesus Christ. Whatever you have today, God can use. God wants to use you. God wants to use me this evening. But it's not a matter if God can do something with us. It's a matter of will we give what we have to God? You say, well, I don't have a lot. I have two legs and two arms and... I, I, I can't sing. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? This may shock you. As of today, I have yet to receive a single phone call from a single church anywhere in the world calling me, asking me to come sing. <laughs> I know, you're shocked. In fact, Brother Romero doesn't even let me into our own choir. <laughs> it hurts. I'm not a singer. You will never see me up here singing. I know you saw me once in the staff group, but they were desperate. <laughs> Everyone else was out of town, and I was the only person left. You notice I was never asked back. So I can't sing, so what? Well, you're not a, a deep academic teacher. I know. I'd be the first to admit that. You say, well, what is it that you have then to have God use you? You know, in high school, in elementary, I was a very shy kid. By nature, I'm still a very shy person. I, I am not someone who likes getting up in front of people. I can remember in elementary, my, my least favorite time of the day was from 8 to 8.15, because that was the time where the teachers were going to take attendance. And that was the time that I would have to speak up and say, <clears throat> here, <laughs> it's not funny. My face would get beet red, my ears and my neck would get on fire, and I would be scared to death of having to stand, to not even stand, just to sit there and say, here. It lasted all the way through college. I was a senior in college, still embarrassed when I had to say, here, or present in class. I can remember my seventh grade year at teen camp. It was the Mount Zion Baptist camp, and pastor was the guest preacher that year. The very first evening, I, I knew that God began to work on my heart. I knew that I, I, I was supposed to surrender. I knew I was supposed to go forward. I was supposed to kneel at the altar. I was supposed to make a decision. But I knew that God could never use me. I, I knew that I would be scared to death to stand in front of people and to speak or to preach. And so I put it off. I also knew what it meant. If I made a decision, there was something that had to happen. After the service, all of the teens went down to what they called reflection circle. And I knew what it meant. If I made a decision, I would have to go in front of everyone, take that microphone, give them my name, my church, and tell them I had made a decision, and there's no way I could do that. And so Monday night, I fought it. Tuesday morning, I fought it. Tuesday evening, God again began to work in my heart, and I said, I, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. Wednesday morning, Wednesday evening, this, the same. Thursday came, and I knew it was the last day. That if I was going to make a decision, it was going to have to happen on Thursday. But again, I knew God couldn't use me. I knew that I didn't have what it takes. I, I, I couldn't stand in front of people. And so I didn't make the decision Thursday morning. Thursday night came, and finally I gave in and said, All right, God, whatever you have for me, I'll go forward. And I remember bowing the knee, and I, I surrendered to preach that night. We went to Reflection Circle, and I honestly thought about skipping. I thought, if I go hide in my bunk, no one will know. I can probably get away with it. And I remember my youth pastor at that time came. He said, all right, everyone, let's go to Reflection Circle. And he walked with me as if he knew I was trying to get out of it. I went as far back in the line as I could, which wasn't a smart thing, because it made that line feel like eternity. 
Finally, it came to me, and they put the microphone in my face, and I said, Chris Venera, North Valley Baptist Church, tonight I surrender to preach. And I remember putting my head down and walking back. I, I struggled with that decision all through high school. Because I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew God couldn't use me. I, I didn't have what it takes. I, I couldn't be a, a great preacher. I couldn't do this or that. And so I knew God couldn't use me. I went to Bible college my freshman year, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every aspect of Bible college at Golden State. I had a great time. I remember Miss Chrissy Hooson, who taught the kindergarten class at that time. She would often have the preacher boys come and preach in her Sunday school class. And I'll never forget, she asked me, and I said yes, and I had my, my notes. A page, long, a page full of notes for five-year-olds. <laughs> Noah and the Ark. I was scared to death. I got up there. I went through those notes. What felt like 30 minutes was probably 30 seconds. I looked up at them, and they stared at me, and I thought they had no idea what I just said. I began to panic. I looked around the room, and I saw some toys, and I walked over. I grabbed a boat and a few animals, and the lesson continued. I walked out of there that day thinking I am a failure. If I can't even preach and teach to, to five-year-olds, there's no way God's ever going to use me. What am I doing here? And as that freshman year came to an end, I began to contemplate, should I go back to Golden State? Maybe I should do something else with my life. Maybe God isn't calling me to preach. And I'll never forget, there was a message preached in College Chapel. I don't remember who preached it. But they preached on, say yes to every opportunity. If you're asked to do something, just say yes. And I made a decision, like probably a naive freshman. I said, all right, I'll say yes to anything and everything. That summer came, and as everyone went home for college, I was asked to teach a boys' Sunday school class, second grade boys' Sunday school class. And I remember that decision I made. And so I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll, I'll teach that second grade boys' Sunday school class. I had no idea what I was in for. It was an awesome summer. We had a great time. But it's amazing, over the course of that summer, God began to do a work in my heart. And really, I began to see a small glimpse of maybe there is something I can do for God. Maybe it's not here. Maybe, it, maybe it's just teaching a Sunday school class. It's just second grade boys. I, I, I know it's not some major prominent position in the church, but it's second grade boys. Maybe I can do this. Maybe God could use me doing this. And over that summer, God did a work in my heart. And as I came back to school, I changed my major to secondary education. I began learning and, and studying, and I graduated. And I've been in the Christian school for the last 15 years. And as I look back on it, not to say that I am anyone special or that I've arrived, but I look at the lives of students and think I had a small part in their life. I, I look at some of the men on staff who once upon a time were students in our high school, and I think, wow, I, God allowed me to have a small part in their life. I, I got to make a little impact in their life. And I think if, if God can use someone like me to do something small with what little I have, God can use you. God wants to use you. This evening, I'm reminded that the outlook was dark. The obligation is pressing. The opportunities are available. The option, this evening, it's yours. You can decide. You might think, I don't have a, I don't have a lot. It, what I have isn't enough. It's just a little bit. But can I say, when you take with the little you have, and you say, God, here it is. Do with it what you want. Use it, God. I've had a prayer that I've prayed every single day from the time I got hired on staff to this morning. It's not deep. It's not anything that's going to blow your minds. It's, God, please use me today. God, take, take my life and just use me. Let me make a difference in the life of someone today. Help me to be a blessing. Let me be an encouragement. This evening, the outlook is dark. The obligation is pressing. The opportunities are available. The option is yours. And let me say, the outcome is eternal. Amen. What we do here is not for today. It's not for tomorrow. It's for all eternity. God can use you. God wants to use you. The choice is yours. Let's bow our head this evening.
I'm going to ask Brother Caleb to come to the piano, please, and I'll have Pastor come and lead the invitation as he sees fit. Let's stand together. I don't have to say one word. You just come. God speak in your heart. Come on. God want little as much when God is in it. Just what we needed tonight. Teenagers, what wonderful young people. Your tender hearts. God bless you. Oh, stay tender before God. Live that way in your home. If you're here to be saved, would you make sure that we see you right now? Raise your hand. If you're lost without Christ, can we lead you to Christ? Who needs to be saved? Anyone? Father, we're so very grateful for your institution, the church. And tonight we've been revived in our heart, encouraged with hope, believing that, God, that you're in control of everything, especially our own lives. God, may we trust you. May we not doubt. May we not fear. May we not live with worry and anxiety. But may we believe that we serve the Almighty God, whose mercies are every new, his faithless every morning. I thank you for your grace, your loving kindness. Thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you for the fact that you gave us the Holy Spirit of God to empower us for your usefulness and for your hope and, and to assist in the work of the ministry with our little that we have, we surrender to Thee. Bless this great, great church, the children's program that's finishing up now in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. amen. So good to be here tonight. You know, um, sometimes in life things don't happen the way we want them to happen. A whole bunch of people, millions tonight in our state, that are bewildered. They're just bewildered. I was sitting there thinking, I wonder where they're going to turn. I wonder if we're not very far away from. I think there might be a room up there. There might be two seats. I think there's a seat over here left. Because we just keep Every day, given the gospel, these people are so hungry. They're so needy. You, you at least have hope. They have no hope. You at least have peace and contentment in your heart in Jesus. They don't have that. You at least know the hymns that we sang tonight and the songs we sang and the courses we sang and heard the special music. I leave here revived, just revived. I guess you had to live in this moment. I was preaching in Arizona, and on Monday night, like Tuesday, Tuesday night, the election, I was going to get up on Wednesday morning, catch a flight to get back here. When I went to bed, Bill Clinton lost the election. It was so wonderful. And I walked outside early in the morning, the headlights said, Bill Clinton's our president. He was a womanizer. He was not a good man. George H. Bush said character matters. We threw it out the window. I was so disillusioned, just so discouraged. And I came to church. Brother Carl and Susie, you'll remember this. Your son was in the quartet with some of those boys, those men. And uh, they sang, I am with thee through the fire through the flood, I'm covered by the blood, for I am with thee. I never did this before, and I don't do it. I don't like it when I go to a church and the choir sings and the pastor stands up, sing it again. We just heard it. Why do we need to hear it again? 
And that night I said, fellas, I can't tell you how that helped me. Would you be willing to sing it again? And I'll tell you what, it got on in that service that night. I know this is going to sound weird, strange. I even had them sing it for the invitation. I think they sang it four, perhaps even five times that night. We walked out, they're so fired up. I am with thee. God, God hasn't forgotten us. Everything's all right in my Father's house. Just maybe the multitudes are going to start coming because they're so disillusioned. Sure love you folks. Let's straighten up the psalm books, please. Corral, if I could see you upstairs in the bridge and tower just briefly. Please pick your kids up tonight. Don't leave them in Patch the Pirate. Pick them up. And then say thank you. Love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>